Hello, my name is Susan Kozell and I'm recording this video from Malmö in southern Sweden. I'm currently a professor in the School of Arts and Culture at Malmö University and today I'm going to talk to you about phenomenology. I'm calling this video a phenomenology in five acts. You might notice that my focus shifts because I'm going to be reading from a script at times and I have uh, other paper books that I'll be reading from. I come from dance and philosophy. In 1993 I found myself performing in an interactive installation and since then I've been specializing in dance and technology but also in different uh, performance modalities such as art installation, participatory performances, workshops, performances over time which we would call endurance performance, wearable computing, performances with social media. And all of this work has been in collaboration with other artists, musicians, dancers, engineers, architects. And currently, I'm still making work and writing about it. Today I won't discuss the many forms or locations or technologies a performance can take place in or can use, but I'll emphasize the way that we can reflect on the process. And I will say that I'm delighted to be taking part as a guest artist in this um, practice-based research in the arts course. Even before I explain phenomenology, I would like to situate it as a way for you to create content as well as a way for you to reflect upon it in academic or critical modes. In effect, this is a creative and a critical methodology. I will also probably slide across the words method and methodology, but I should say that in general, strictly speaking, methodology refers to the umbrella term which contains the wider implications of choosing a method, such as the worldview, the ethics, um, the ontology. Method usually refers to the step-by-step -step approach of it, but I may, as I said, just refer to both terms. Phenomenology is a word that has as its, at its root phenomenon, which means something that happens. It is one of the subjective experience-based methodologies that, along with autoethnography at the moment, is receiving a lot of attention. A bit of history. It was founded by Edmund Husserl, philosopher, at the end of the 19th century, and it refers to a return to lived experience. In fact, that was the phrase that um, became, in a way, the mantra of phenomenology, a return to lived experience. It was popular in the early to mid 20th century as a way to anchor otherwise abstract thought into the lives, events, sensations, and actions of real people. Maurice Merleau-Ponty closely examined perception and, in his later writings, he was fascinated by how the painter Cezanne saw the world and created his paintings. He was fascinated by the relation between the eye, the hand, and the creation of the painting. Having said that, it's important to note that the early phenomenologists did not really ground their phenomenology in creative processes, but they left the door open for the rest of us to do this. And this is exactly what has been happening a lot for the past 10 years or so. Phenomenology is used to anchor practice within research to overcome several unhelpful divides. The first unhelpful divide that phenomenology helps to overcome is that between theory and practice. The second divide that phenomenology can be used to overcome is that between mind and body. And the third unhelpful divide is that between solitary experience and shared experiences. Each of these unhelpful divides, once you move beyond them, you end up in a position where you can really helpfully examine and understand and reflect upon performance work because so much performance work at the moment is already from a ground beyond, beyond these old dualities. This video has several sections. You can call them sections or movements or acts. I think we should use the theatrical metaphor and say that what you just heard was Act 1, the introduction. 
I'll briefly say where we're going from here. In Act 2, I will take you through some sections from my book, Closer, which is on the reading list. I'll also refer to a chapter I wrote recently for a Routledge collection on research in the arts, edited by Carlson and Biggs, that came out in 2010. And throughout my discussion, I will indicate several points for deeper reading. I realise that now I'm speaking to quite a diverse audience of practitioners. Some of you may be interested in opening this up to deeper research and reflections in a more academic mode, whereas some of you may not find this interesting at all. I invite you to just let that wash over you if that's the case. Act 3 will take you through a series of instructions for how to do a phenomenology from the book Closer. Then you will have a chance to pause the video and practice doing your own phenomenology. You can apply phenomenological instructions to a project you are developing for this course, or you can simply try some free movement improvisation, manipulation of objects, or experimentation with text. Have a notebook with you, or if you are thoroughly digital, use a computer or other devices to take your notes. In Act 4, I will open out a little bit further two aspects of phenomenology, First, the process phase of a phenomenology. And second, the idea that phenomenology can access more subtle emotions, affects, and liminal qualities. In other words, we will move from a phenomenology of the senses to a phenomenology of affect. In Act 5, I'll offer a slightly revised method, attempting to get at affect, and we'll have a pause for improvisation and note-taking. Let's see if we can get through all this in the next 10 minutes. Act 2. Reading from Closer. As a method, phenomenology involves a return to lived experience, a listening to the senses and insights that arrive obliquely, unbidden, in the midst of movement experiments, or quite simply, in the midst of life. Phenomenology, in short, helps me to respect these sensations and inner voices, these unformed ideas, thoughts, or images that emerge directly from the experience of being in computational systems, such as telematics, motion capture, or networked wearable computing. Bodies are more than just meat. They are sources of intelligence, compassion, and extraordinary creativity. In some respects, the book Closer comes from a personal and creative place. I needed a methodology to allow for a passion for philosophical concepts to converge with innate ideas and even critiques that were embedded in my body and surfaced through my performance experiments. I needed a methodology that would not only respect my highly subjective embodied experiences but that might provide a dynamics for revealing broader cultural assumptions and practices, for acknowledging the reality that all bodies exist with and through other bodies in social and political contexts. And I needed a methodology that operated through resonance rather than through truth. This is to say that my experience is not going to be held up as a truth to be mapped onto other people across time and cultures, but it is to say that one person's embodied experience, when it is reflected upon, may actually open out meaning or resonances for other people's. I now see, as I look back at writing closer, that my motivation was to reconcile what I experienced with what others were saying. At that time, I worked as a dancer in various early um, virtual reality or media, interactive media installations. And it was in the early 90s, the heyday of the cyberpunk era. So there was a lot of rhetoric around leaving the body behind on how digital technologies were this glorious freedom that allowed us to escape from the dead weight, the decay even, of the meat of the body. My experience, however, in interactive installation was exactly the opposite. And I actually needed a way of 
understanding and then writing about in a critical academic mode my experience so that I could provide a counterpoint to what was being said at the time. I should say it was very empowering too because dancers are often dismissed as the aesthetic demonstration of a virtual environment or a sensing system. There is clearly a gendered component here of the sort when an object begins to talk back. The body effectively, the dancing body, my dancing body, began to disagree with what was being said about the technologies and phenomenology gave me a way to articulate and expand this. Now here's a point for deeper reading for those of you who are interested in artistic research. It's from the, my chapter in that book, the Biggs and Carlson book. I suggest that phenomenology, when it's used in an artistic research context, begins by revisiting basic tensions between practice and theory, revealing a deep entanglement between the two. Instead of trying to stitch these domains together, in a grand unifying gesture that still preserves a fundamental antinomy, a shift of perspective is enacted by viewing both theoretical and practical pursuits in terms of motion and materiality it is possible to avoid reinforcing such unhelpful distinctions. I will say also that phenomenology is a process and in that chapter for the artistic research collection I described improvising with a new piece of software. At first, in the rehearsal process, I was planted in front of the computer monitor to see what the software was doing to my movement in real time. Over days and weeks of rehearsal, I began to discover that I didn't have to be so visually tied to what was happening. I began to move more freely, and by the end, I had an intuitive sense, almost as if there were eyes in the back of my head, of what the software was doing to my movement and according to what aesthetic and what time lag and what kinesthetic qualities. The content that I'm describing is less significant than the fact that phenomenology can grow with you through your devising process of a performance. It is not in effect just a one-shot analysis like an ethnographic questionnaire. If you develop your reflective practices, they will offer different material to you as your work develops. Sometimes a phenomenological reflection will open up questions, sometimes you'll have insights, sometimes frustration, and sometimes, well, sometimes nothing. A bit like life, really. Act three. Now, the method. So we're working up to a moment where you'll pause and do some improvisation. I'm reading from page 53 of this book, if you happen to have it. No, page 52, the very bottom. Here I quote Varela and Cher, who um, have done interesting work on phenomenology from the perspective of biology, so one of the hard sciences. And they say that this method for investigation has two main dimensions. One is a procedure for accessing the phenomenal domain, which is to say experience, and the other is a means for expression and validation within a community. At the beginning of this video, I emphasized another dim uh, dimension, which is that phenomenology can actually help you create your artistic content. You're not just accessing and understanding experience or validating it, you're creating it. And here I'm going to go through in a reasonably quick way steps of how to do a phenomenological uh, reflection, phenomenological inquiry. For those of you who might have practices in mindfulness meditation, you will notice a certain similarity here as we go on. I'm going to leave out some steps so you might be interested afterwards in going back to the text and reading in the, the, um, the detail. First, take your attention to this very moment. Suspend the main flow of thought. Call your attention 